Welcome, everyone. I'm so glad that you're all here. Uh, welcome to the Illustrated Gothic Chapbook. Um, I would first like to tell you that I am a scholar. I'm a doctoral candidate at Marquette University, which is located in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And as a result of that, I do always start my presentations with a land and water use acknowledgement. So uh, without further ado, here we go. Um, Milwaukee and Marquette University are located in the traditional Potawatomi, Ho-Chunk, and Menominee homeland. In this place, the people of Wisconsin sovereign Ashinaabe, Ho-Chunk, Menominee, Oneida, and Mohican nations remain present. I honor them all and their ancestors who have stewarded this land uh, for all time. I'm also mindful of a responsibility that we all have as scholars who practice here uh, to practice good relations with our land and water as the elders and ancestors have done. Um, this responsibility includes acknowledging these cultural traditions and informing good stewardship of our environment, practicing ongoing good relations with the sovereign nations who care for it. In the spirit of reconciliation, we can create the conditions of hospitality for our indigenous scholars and community members and all who have yet to walk with us. So thank you for understanding and listening to my land and water acknowledgement right here on the shores of Lake Michigan. So to start today, I just wanna talk a little bit about what a Gothic chapbook physically is as an object and then we will get into a lot more detail. But just as an introduction, first, let me physically show you a couple. I'm gonna grab them and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so that you can see me, because I'm gonna use the camera. I have two to show you because there are two standard sizes of Gothic chat books. They look like this and I'm putting them next to my face so you can kind of get an idea of the size. So you can see that they're thin. Uh, they're usually between 32 and 36 and 72 pages long. Um, they're covered in rag stock, which is you know just really, really cheap wrapping paper. And then I, I reassure you too, these are just examples. They're cheap. Uh, they're from the same period as Gothic chapbooks, but they're not Gothic chapbooks. I couldn't afford one as a graduate student. This is a manual for how to build a machine. <laughs> and this one actually, this is Byron the Jiaur, the Turkish tale in chapbook form. Um, anyhow, long story short, that is what they look like. Um, when you touch them, they feel kind of soft to the touch, uh, very kind of cuddly reading material. Um, the smaller size is very handy for concealment. It fits inside my hands, or we have records of it being in ladies' bosoms. It can go up your sleeve, it can go in your pocket. It's a very handy size and very easy to travel with and pack into things. The larger one is just easier to read because it has bigger uh, font sizes in it. Okay, so sharing screen again. Okay, these chat books are inexpensive, usually ranging between six pence and a shilling. They are, like I said, covered in rag stock. And the reason that um, they're sometimes called blue books is that the paper in the rag stock tended to be blue, but that was not always the case. I have found many of them that are covered in many other colors. So it's whatever handy rag stock was around. Could be pink, could be gray. I've seen some yellow ones too. So it could really vary. Um, they're ephemeral objects. And what I mean by ephemeral in this particular case is that they were never intended to last. They weren't built to be collectibles. During this period of time, I'm talking about the early 1800s, people did buy books to keep uh, for long periods of time, but those were made in very fancy bindings and they were very, very expensive and meant to last. And that's what's usually in library collections now, where people have bought something expensive and kept it and then donated it uh, at the end of their lives or whenever they dissolved their collection. Uh, chapbooks books are ephemeral in that they weren't designed to last forever. Um, some people preserved them, but not very many people preserved them. What we know about them suggests that chapbooks were passed from person to person to person until they started to wear out and then were repurposed for some other paper use, um, like cleaning and building fires and uh, toilet issues. Um, also, there were um, uh, there is difficulty researching chapbooks. The reason there aren't very many us, of us in this field is that chapbooks can be hard to track down. Like I said, the original owners complicated things sometimes. Um, if they wanted to keep the chapbook to make it 
part of their collection and keep it forever, not reuse it for something else. They tended to collect it with other similarly shaped publications and take it to a binder and have it custom bound with those other pieces. So sometimes we're talking here about a collection of eight Gothic chapbooks, but sometimes we're talking about somebody's children's books, somebody's like recipe thing, somebody's songbook, a Gothic chapbook, and some religious tracts all bound together. And so the problem with that is that when something like that gets donated to a library, librarians look at it and they see a collection of miscellaneous works. And oftentimes they're anonymous too. So it can be very difficult to find something like this in a library catalog system. Um, usually they get labeled if they're not bound as chapbooks or pamphlets. Sometimes they're called tracts and um, sometimes they get labeled as novellas or short stories. So that means you have to, if you're gonna try to do this, you have to go to a library and look for all of those terms. And then you also have to guess the names of volumes. So I've had good luck sometimes looking for volumes called Gothic stories or Gothic tales or pamphlet collections, things like that. Um, sometimes you can find them that way. Um, sometimes in order to find Gothic chapbooks, you have to be willing to go to a library's ephemera. So what they tend to do in libraries that don't have large collections of Gothic chapbooks is place them with the other types of things that are a little unsorted. So for example, near me is the Newberry Library in Chicago. If you wanna see their chat books, you have to ask for their ephemera boxes and then you dig through and you just weed out all of the theater um, pieces and all the ticket stubs and various and sundry other types of publications. Um, and then they'll you know, be there in the bottom of the box somewhere. Uh, that's how I have found most of these. So, a little history for you. The earliest incarnations of Gothic chapbooks go back into the 18th century. What we're talking about there is an eight page long little publication. Um, and my hero, Diane Longhovler, described them as the direct descendants of ballads and broadsides, uh, having some sort of residue of direct oral to written tradition. So storytelling from the community in print form. She also described them as crude, error-ridden, and sensational in nature. I agree with her about the 18th century texts, pretty crude. Uh, we'll get to why I don't agree with her when we look at the later ones. Um, so scholars like Hovler and Franz Potter, Frederick Frank, Angela Cook, and Gary Kelly have tended to focus on the literary content of these pieces because that's their area of expertise and good for them on that. Um, they are looking at the developments in the Gothic after Anne Radcliffe and after Matthew Lewis, how things change. And it is clear that these Gothic chat books did have a large audience and demanded, which demanded certain types of fiction at this time. So Franz Potter, for example, his new monograph, lots of detail about the market as it was created for Gothic chat books and how the different publishers adjusted to that. Um, today, I'm going to add kind of a different dimension of this. I'm going to go in a little different direction because I'm a book historian. So I'm going to think about the chat book as a piece of art unto itself. And I'm going to think about how it works as a physical object, because what it's doing is creating both form and function kind of at the same time around storytelling using both illustration and text. Um, so that's kind of where I'm headed. The chapbook as a physical object changed really dramatically in the early 1790s. And this made a whole different type of chapbook possible um, that supported this new readership that demanded Gothic fiction. And during their heyday, which is this span of time from about 1790 to 1820, Gothic chapbooks became more and more visual in nature. Um, they invested money in more expensive, more elaborate illustrations increasingly over that time. Uh, and they became more and more closely connected in terms of how the illustration was connected with the text of the piece. Um, they were also increasingly over that time made with better materials. Um, and they featured this combination of retellings of Gothic fiction and 
over time, more and more unique stories that were written just for chapbook purposes. So in a way, what this does is this creates this market, this increasing market of readers who love illustrated Gothic fiction. And in my mind, that is what prepares the market for the Gothic penny serial that follows along in the 1830s. Okay, so let's back up a little and see what Diane was talking about. So this is the chapbook, uh, the Gothic chapbook really, in the 18th century. What we have here is the famous history of the Lancashire witches, which is from 1780 or so. It has been printed on one large sheet of handmade paper that's been folded 12 times to make a duodecimo publication. And then it was stab bound, sold untrimmed, and um, sent out to the public. The illustrations in these older chapbooks, if you look at this closely, you really can see that there isn't very much detail available. So if I look, for example, at the faces here, they're kind of hard to read in terms of their expression. And the lines are pretty thick. There's not a lot of detail here. The reason for that is that these were woodcuts that were carved on the plank side or the flat side of a piece of wood. And therefore, they're relying on the grain of the wood to hold up the shape. The problem with this re relief printing on wood blocks is that even no matter how good you are at carving, the material that you're carving into can only hold up a ridge of a certain width before it will collapse under the press. So if you make your lines too fine and the ridges are too narrow, when you press down the ink onto the block, uh, they'll topple over and snap and then the ink will not get picked up for that line. Also, over time, when you're relief printing on wood blocks, the edges of the carving do begin to wear down because wood I mean, it can be a hard wood, but it's still eventually under the pressure of metal is going to wear down, just erode. Um, so this makes woodcut illustrations a little bit unreliable for sales and marketing purposes, if you think about it. The first run probably has the sharpest pictures, but by the time you have run this wood block a few times through the press, it starts to look mushier and mushier and have less and less detail, and more of the lines are gonna go away because they'll wear down too low to pick up for the ink to hit the page in a relief press. All right, so I mentioned some things here. Uh, these are printed, like I said, entirely in relief. So that means that the wood block is in the same form as all of the rest of the typeset. Uh, it's all one big press. The illustrations here, like I said, woodcuts, stab bound and made on laid paper and sold untrimmed. I'm gonna show you pictures of all of those things so you know what I'm talking about. A stab binding is made by taking a piece of string on a needle and poking it through three holes in the spine of the folded pamphlet. So, and it's just showing you where the different stab marks are. So number one goes through the middle, number two goes around the outside, all the way across to number three going back down and so on. And then in the end, you tie it in a little knot, cut the trim, trim the ends off the string, and then maybe just burn it a tiny bit to melt the knot onto itself. Okay. This is what a stab binding looks like when you see it in a book. Um, you'll really only see it in pamphlets and chapbooks and that type of thing because it won't hold a heavy binding. Like a, a heavy choir, like multiple choirs together doesn't work. This is only for just single, uh, smaller publications like this. Um, you can see that the knots and the string are actually very durable. This is a 200 year old chapbook that I have in this picture and it is still holding together quite nicely. In the end, it does start to eat away at the paper a little bit in the middle, but the vast majority of chapbooks that I find still have their string bindings intact. They very rarely come apart. Okay, these are the two kinds of paper that we're talking about here. Um, the chapbook from the 1780s is published on what is called laid paper. That refers to the process of making the paper. So the pulp sits on a tray, like a little substrate surface where it is pressed in and moisture drips out the bottom. 
this surface that was used to make paper before the 1780s had ridges on it that would show up in the paper and make these deep little lines. It almost looks like paper toweling, right? And it feels like that too. It's rough to the touch. And when you're pressing ink on the page, it does affect the way the ink lays on the paper. So it can make it a little bit more difficult to read and a little less clear. Also for illustration purposes, this type of paper eliminates the possibility of some of the finer types of illustration because it's just too rough. It has too much texture. It would interfere with the visual image. To the right, this kind of smoother looking texture is wove paper. Wove paper had been invented for a long time, but it comes into popular use in the chapbook market at the same time that the Gothic chapbooks are on the rise. So around 1790 or so. Um, and wove paper is made on a mesh that is so fine that when you press the paper making process, when you press it down onto it, it doesn't pick up the lines. Instead, it's nice and smooth like this. So this is what allows for cleaner type faces to show up nicely in contrast against a smooth surface. And it also is what allows for good illustration because there's no texture here to try to overcome uh, when you're printing. So that is wove paper. This is what I mean by a chapbook being sold untrimmed. Um, this is only a problem for us nowadays for research purposes, right? So when these were originally sold, it was up to you how you wanted to cut the page as the consumer. So you could just slice it with a letter opener and call it good. But if you were gonna bind this together with a bunch of other chapbooks and you already knew that, you might not cut it yet because you might just guillotine the whole stack at the same time or have your um, custom bindery person do that for you. Uh, so that was why they, they were sold this way. Um, there was just no point cutting it because you didn't know what the consumer would wanna do with it. So when I'm in a library doing research, sometimes I come across this. My advice to you, if you do stumble across something like this that is uncut, libraries won't cut them for you. So the best move is to stick your phone in between the pages with the flash on and just try to take photos inside and you can still read it. It's just very difficult. It's a time consuming process. Okay. So let's do a little comparison. So over on the left are the characteristics of those 18th century chapbooks that I was talking about, and that's our Witches of Lancashire, one that we saw. Um, on the right, I'm gonna bring about some of these technological changes that were in effect when the Gothic chapbook heyday started in 1790s. Um, these are very different physical objects from their predecessors. So first of all, I should say that they feel different to the touch, like you can, between the two, your hands will tell you the difference. Um, secondly, they look different to the eye. Like you can immediately see a difference comparing the two next to each other. So some of the technological developments that allow for that, uh, one is the iron press. Um, this lets you print a larger print area at once so you can print more frames on a single run. Um, and this lets you print faster and with more accuracy. So that's really cool. You also get stereotype as commonplace. I'll explain how stereotypes are made in a minute, but a stereotype is great because it allows you to set up a very accurate draft that then becomes the template for all your future runs of the same text. Uh, there are processes in place after about 1780-ish that would allow paper to be machine-made from diverse fibers and then bleached. This is great because not only is it wove paper, but it's a nice stark white paper that makes a really good contrast with black ink. Um, it makes it much easier for the eye to read than some of the previous paper colors that were kind of yellower and didn't have as good a contrast with the ink, especially cheap ink, which is kind of brownish even when it was newish, not great. Um, almost every chat book that I have found after 1790 is on that nice wove paper. So it is fine and smooth, very easy to read on. And most importantly for me anyway, all of these chat books, uh, for the most part, have these illustrations at the beginning 
that are made from or on engraved copper plates and then printed on a different type of press. They're not relief printed. And those are tipped into the publication, which means you have a relief printing job that runs with the text. And then you have a intaglio printing or uh, etching printing job that is printed separately. And then the two are put together to make the chat book. And this, this is genius. We'll go over how and why in just a minute. First, some technology for you. So this is the wooden common press. This hasn't changed much since Gutenberg. It is what those original 1780s and prior Gothic chapbooks were printed on. And you can see how this works. The form is here. It's hiding under this frisket sheet. That, that brown paper is the frisket sheet. Um, so that these are the words in the little gray boxes there that have been set up in type standing up in the form. And then this whole tray slides forward under this golden plate. And this long lever that goes out toward this nice gentleman's elbow is pulled to the side. And then this screw shape here is what drives the plate down onto the paper, which will be sitting on top of all of this, and pick up the ink, because there's already been ink rolled on the typeface uh, before the frisket sheet goes down. That's how relief printing was done for a very, very long time. Um, and still you can make relief printing this way. This is just a difficult machine to have in a print shop because you can see it takes up a lot of space. Also, because of all of its wooden joints and the way that it takes so much pressure and such a big lever to use, just the action of pulling that lever again and again will cause this machine to shimmy and move around. So it would like walk around your print shop unless you somehow bolted it to the ground or attached it to the ceiling. So this makes a very large footprint. It's a little difficult to navigate the rest of your shop around such a big clunky thing that can't be moved. Okay, so these are, oops. Okay, these belong to the Bodleian's bibliographical, bibliographical press. Um, which is over, if you go to the library in Oxford, it's the Scholle Musique building, um, not so far from the camera. Um, if you go in there, you can, you can visit, take a tour and that kind of thing. Um, they have iron presses. These blue ones here are iron presses that do the same thing as the Gutenberg press did. But because they are made of iron, they don't take up as much space to provide the same amount of force down on the page. So you might even be able to fit two or three of these little tabletop ones in the same amount of space that your old Gutenberg type press would have taken up. That's a big deal because the way that printers operated, space was really at a premium. You needed space to store your type cases and you needed space to dry paper, a lot of space actually to dry paper and um, soak paper. and if your press could take up less room and still print huge amounts of material, that was great for you. Um, these are from, their collection is from throughout the 19th century, but you can get a good idea of how these work by going in and they'll demonstrate them for you. It's really nice. Okay. The nice, the other good thing about these presses, the little blue press here, is that it makes it possible for print shops to have a second press of a different type crammed into the same room. So it's that's this one in the back here with the big spokes on the outside. The reason it has those big spokes is it takes a lot of arm power to run this thing because it's, it's creating so much force on a roller. I have a better picture of it that I'll show you here. Okay, this is an etching press, also known as an intaglio press. It creates these engraved illustrations that you'll find at the beginnings of most Gothic chapbooks. On this type of press, the ink, if you look at this copper plate, it has many little etched grooves in it that have been scratched into it by a very pointed little tool. And the press here, the people who work this press have pushed the ink down into those grooves very meticulously, making sure there's ink in every single little groove on the whole um, plate. Then they go back with a very clean, very fine rag and they wipe off all the excess ink from the coppery facing parts that are gonna be white at the end. A very clean copper plate makes a good etching or a good engraving, I mean. So then the paper 
is placed down onto the top of the plate. And on top of the paper, they place two or three wool or felt blankets. Um, and the purpose of this is that the paper is soaking wet. The blankets are going to go through the roller along with the paper and the copper plate. And that roller is going to put pressure down on the blankets. And the fibers of the blankets are going to push down into the paper and push the paper into the copper plate where the grooves are and where the ink is. And that's how the ink is going to then lift up out of those grooves and become the image that you see in the end product. So that is how an etching press works. You can see this is a completely different process from relief printing. Um, and that's important to know because it shows you, uh, it demonstrates for you actually the technological advancement that I'm talking about where you're coordinating between two different types of presses to make the Gothic chapbook. It's not as simple as the pre predecessors in the 1780s. Also, if you're ever in this line of work and you're looking at these and you wanna know whether it was made on a relief press or whether it was made on a press like this, an intaglio press, just look at the corners like this and you can see where there has been a plate impression on the paper where the edge of that copper plate has made a line all the way around. Um, don't touch 18th century prints or 19th century prints, but if you run your finger, you'd feel a bump. I can usually find it by laying the paper in front of me and sighting along the paper surface, and you can see it there too. Um, to just, if you want to know for yourself, hey, is this illustration printed in relief or printed in intaglio or an etching, engraving, that's how you can tell. So here's a side by side comparison for you. This is comparing the 1780s Gothic chapbook to the one in the 1790s and forward that I'm talking about. So on the left is our original and on the right is the Black Forest or the Cavern of Horrors, which I think was probably printed in 1802. And we can start, I think the best thing to look at once again is faces. Because of course you're a human being and you know how to read expression uh, as it is encoded in illustration, right? On the left though, I don't know if I can really see what expressions these people are making in this woodcut. They just kind of have eyes, noses, and mouths. Um, they look kind of Germanic, but other than that, I don't know much about what they're feeling or thinking or anything like that. They don't appear to be that human. They're kind of cartoonish if I think about it, I guess. On the right, however, in the engraving, I can tell that this is a human being with dimension. Um, he has proportion. He has a face that has uh, blushing on his cheeks. His eyes are very much locked on the uh, skeleton across from him, and he is reaching for his sword. And this is an expression, a posture, and a body language that I can recognize um, as one human to another. It's a relatable human face. That's something that you can't achieve with a woodcut. Also, if you look at the um, skeleton here, you can tell that the person who has drawn this is a professional illustrator who has taken the time to be educated and know what a skeleton looks like. They probably consulted a medical book or looked at someone else's drawing of a skeleton and, and picked it up from there. Um, but it is definitely more thought out and more detailed than this little devil over here on the old broom from 1780. Okay. As far as I've been able to tell, there are no um, chapbooks from this period, from, from 1790 to 1830, that used color engraving printing processes. Um, you could do that. It was physically possible at the time, but it was very expensive and very time consuming. You would have to run the paper through that big drum intaglio press multiple times once for each color that you wanted to add to the page. Um, that would be very, very expensive. But I have learned from multiple scholars that in this period of time, women and children were all over print shops and their labor was cheap. Uh, so as opposed to, you know, having to print color using the actual process and printing ink, the process of hand coloring, people could just pay a penny and have that done. So for example, this particular caption indicates to the consumer that they 
should do that. It says the terror of Henry at the appearance of a skeleton waving a bloody sword. You can see there's no blood in the carving or in the etching. So the blood was to be added by the woman or child who hand colored this for the consumer. It's just the price of this one was six pence and somebody didn't pay the extra pence for the coloring to be done. You can also see here, let me see if I can show you. Here we go. A difference in the type setting, right? Although the one on the left has larger type faces, the one on the right is a little bit of an achievement because it is so clear. There are no mistakes in the type setting. It has nice spacing, nice even spacing. No, um, like over here, the, the word that and a uh are mashed against each other. And down here in the word during, the U has been typeset upside down, right? That's the old copy. And up on the top left here, where it says which is reveling in a gentleman's house, you can see there's a smudge where the ink didn't get picked up in a couple places, uh, where most likely the person who was inking this typeset just didn't do a good job, or the ink was cheap and it had an oily spot in it that didn't pick up enough pigment. Either way, bad typesetting, right? But the Gothic chapbook on your right, The Black Forest, very clear, very nice and easy to read. I only see some excess ink at the very bottom, um, which really isn't too bad. It doesn't interfere, I think, with the way that the text reads. Um, the reason for this, most likely, is stereotype, which I will explain. So on the left, when you are making a um, print and standing up type in forms, uh, it the only way to make good money doing that was to do it very quickly. So you would stack up your typeset and put it in the form and quickly print it and then take it all back out again, put it back in the cases, sort it by letter for the next project. And the quicker you did that, the more money you could make. So the thing that happened was it was very easy. There are a number of different places where an error could occur in that process. So the person who's taking the type out of the form and putting it into the type cases can screw up and put it in the wrong bin very easily because they're doing it very quickly. It's a dirty job and um, they've got to go fast. Also, the other direction, the person who's pulling out the type to put it in the composing stick, what they're doing is lining up type against their thumb on this little stick and they have to do that backwards and upside down. So it can be very easy to make an error doing that and put it in the form and run it. And if there, if you have a mistake, your options are either to reset that whole line because the width will be wrong if you've got some types of mistakes in it or to just run it with the mistake. And as you can see on the left here, they would pretty often for financial reasons, go ahead and run it with the mistake. Um, and that's just pretty common from that period. The area of stereotyping, though, the era of stereotyping, makes it more financially feasible to shoot for clean text on your first run. And this is because if you could get it right once, you could stereotype it and then reprint it till kingdom come. And so you've invested a little more in that first run, more time to make it better, but then you don't have to do that for any future editions. So it's a little bit of an investment in your printing property. Okay. This is what I'm talking about when I mean stereotyping. So down here at the bottom, you can see this is the form where the text has been stood up in these little rows. These are the little typeset pieces of um, that probably led some type metal. And um, they're stood up all in little rows and they are pressed together by this frame on the outside. You just turn these little or these big screws and it presses them together uh, from the sides and you can lock them in from the top as well. So they're nice and tight. They don't wiggle around in the press. When that is done and all of this typeface is very clean, you take this very, very thick piece of paper and you soak it wet and then you press it down and lay it across your typeface and smoothly press down into the form. And then what this does when you pick it up is take a negative of all of those things that are on that form. Then you can fill this once it's dry with molten typeface or type metal, excuse me, molten type metal. And once it hardens, it can be used for many, many reprints, um, which is fantabulous. It's a great 
trick to make your um, shop more profitable because it means that you can use these stereotype sheets to keep printing something while somebody is next door using your very expensive typefaces to set up the next document. I should say that type metal, like the, the little letters in the different fonts and things, those are the most expensive things in the room at a print shop. Um, and they were really at a premium. They took up a lot of space and they also could be um, kind of easily worn down over time. Uh, so it was very important that they were handled correctly. And just the fact that stereotyping meant you had to strike your typeface fewer times for the same project was great. A huge time saver and money saver. Okay, so I should say too, for context, that these technical improvements are not the only factor driving the popularity of these Gothic chapbooks. There definitely were these external pressures that did contribute to the demand for this material. Um, and I have to just talk for a minute here about audience, because I, I want you to know the kind of people I'm talking about when we get to the later parts about illustration. So the reason that most people did not line up to buy something like The Monk was that it was completely unaffordable for the majority of folks. The reason for this is that novels were almost all bought at this period of time, and I'm talking about like 1800 or so, by circulating libraries, and they were the ones who demanded certain forms of publication from the publishers. So they said to them, hey, we want hardbound books. We want them in three to five volumes. We're going to buy hundreds of them, so you've got to listen to us. Right. The problem here is that the membership fee in these libraries could range anywhere from 10 to 41 shillings in a year. And then you also had to pay a book rental fee and late fees. So you need a pretty substantial amount of money to get books out from someplace like that. To buy a book, a consumer would have to pay around 31 shillings and six pence. And I'm getting this from Simon Elliott. I think I've seen it lots of other places. I think that's a pretty solid number. That's a lot of money when you're talking about the wages that existed at that time. So in the chart below, what I did is I picked an above average. So somebody with some skills working in London in 1800 and, you know, basically got this from a short history of English agriculture, Kirtler, that's where that came from. Um, and I, you know, have here a weekly budget for that person. And you can see that their income about 15 shillings plus a little whatever they could grow in their garden, maybe a little extra penny that they get from selling some used goods or crafts or whatever. So about 17 and six, perhaps. But this person is still running at a little bit of a deficit, according to this budget. Uh, and I want you to know that book materials would come down here under sundries. And we're talking about six pence, which coincidentally in this weekly budget is just enough to buy one chapbook. What a funny coincidence. I think that probably has something to do with what the price of them was, because uh, this is the, the market for these types of publications, for, for the chapbooks, I mean. I'm sure they would have loved to buy the monk, but could not do so. The other part of this demand that gets created during this period of time is the dawning of popular culture. So of course there were scandals in the newspapers, in the coffee shops, people talking about the monk, for example, um, because of its content, its gore, its mixing of religion and rape and like, horrible like well basically fiendish characters you know devils and demons and things like that um having all of that together in, in one book pretty scandalous um also at the same time right after the monk had come out and became popular you very quickly have operas and uh, pantomimes stage versions of pieces of the monk um and Matthew Lewis himself is out there with the Castle Spectre, his own play that he had written um, and produced. So you get a big buzz in the environment of people wanting to see more of this story. Um, also, the Bleeding Monk had already, or, sorry, the Bleeding Nun had already been popular because she was a folklore character. So there already were stories about her and um, kind of little toys you could get with the Bleeding Nun on them, um, where she's like, a regular nun and then you pull the string and all of a sudden she's this monster with a skull showing. There's toy theater bleeding nuns, so you could get them all over the place. And this helps make demand too 
for this and similar products. Okay, so this is perhaps the earliest example I can come up with of an abridgment of the monk. And it's, I think of this as kind of a starting point for the Gothic chapbooks, um, where at first what they were doing was just imitating what was in the novels. So they would take entire passages out, sometimes word for word, and just present them in a shorter form, just trying to cut out extra content. In this case, they managed to get the three volumes of the monk down to 148 pages. That is still humongous for a chapbook. Most chapbooks, the big ones are 72 pages long and the most of them are 36 pages long. So this was too big. That's what makes me think this was kind of a prototype is it would have cost too much to make for the price they could sell it. But this version, what's interesting about it, I think, and I wish I could show it to you, they wouldn't let me photograph it, is that this is the first like really detailed frontispiece that comes along. You can see this if you have institutional access to 18th century collections online. They have a scan of it. It's not great, but they have a scan. Um, there is a physical copy in Harvard's Houghton Library of this edition, um, but they will not allow you to photograph it. Uh, anyway, this basically this edition, what I want to point out about it is that we're talking here about October of 1797, which is just very short period of time after the original publication of the monk. So this came out just rapidly, so quickly. Not a lot of, I think, improvement went into it though, in terms of making it anything more than just copy paste from the novel itself. The second edition though, we can start doing some talking about. So, oops, so here we have the frontispiece from the second extant edition. There might have been other ones in between, we don't really know. This was published in December of 1799. Here is the frontispiece, and it also has an embellished title page, which I'll show you in a sec, I think. Uh, but the title page here, it attributes this text to Matthew Lewis, but if you read this, you can find that it doesn't really contain any of Matthew Lewis's work. It's been changed pretty significantly. But I like to look at this um, frontispiece to see kind of what level here we're talking about. This is one of the very earliest of the heyday chat books, right? And look at the level of detail in this. Like the background is showing this chaos that's happened. There's so much texture, so much darkness. Um, and the, she uh, looks like she's almost glowing down here um, at the bottom um, where she's shouting, spare me for Christ's sake, spare me. I am innocent, indeed I am. And then it says page number 85. So the interesting thing about this, other than Virginia, of course, being shiny and white and beautiful, is that a couple of things are indicated to us by this particular frontispiece. First, it tells us that whoever made this frontispiece, which was J. Wyatt, who drew it and then also did the engraving, this person was in the same shop, or at least in very close communication to the people who were producing the relief parts of the text, so the actual typesetting. Um, the reason we know this is that the sculptor or the engraver was in the presence of the original and had the page numbers to prove it. Also, the detail in this scene indicates deep familiarity with the text. Um, just in terms of exactly what's happening in the background, the kind of setting that we have with the statue here, um, the way that the characters are in presentation to each other, um, all of that comes right out of the text. Um, so it tells us that there was a plan for this illustration to be closely connected with the text. So it's not an abstraction, because it might have been easy to just put a picture here of some lady being rescued by some guy, right? And you could have done that without ever having read this story. But instead, we here have a very specific connection between this image and the text that it's illustrating. Also, I think that the caption itself is very important because this reference with the page number, this used to be common in nonfiction, but this is one of the earliest uses that I found of it in a fiction publication. And what it demonstrates here is not just that the illustrator was in the room with the person who made the rest of the chapbook, but that they were also sensitive to what the reader wanted to experience by using this frontispiece. So 
this is what connects, I think, this engraver and their imagination with that of the reader. So as I think about the reader of this text, and perhaps they weren't the most educated people, perhaps they didn't have the most sophisticated vocabularies, and you know, perhaps they were less kind of fluent or masterful of their reading than the original purchasers of the monk novel itself, right? But this engraver is able to help them visualize this complicated scene. And if you think about it, the thing that your imagination does when you read, the better that you get at reading, the more detailed of an image you can create in your mind, right? This is an example of an artist's interpretation being used to support that image being created in someone's imagination as they read. And I think that's a very exciting development. There's also, oops, there's more detail for you. Um, okay. There we go. This is the title page from that same um, chat book. And you can see here that there's a second illustration. Um, this is Agnes. She's fleeing back toward the castle, and Conrad is kneeling in terror, and he can't run with her because he's, you know, so debated and gothic. Uh, <laughs> but uh, anyway, I guess I would just say that part of what this does with this very elaborate and ornate uh, title page is indicate for the reader that this is a higher quality publication. Right? It gives them kind of a sense of, wow, this is something valuable, something fancy. Um, these were not meant to, to appear cheap. Like this is just as beautiful as something that you would see in the beginning of one of the triple deckers, right? It's just being printed in a much less expensive form. Um, and that's possible because of the advancements in technology. It's very cool. Okay, and I, I would say with this particular um, chat book, the main advancement here is not in the way the text reads, but in how the visual design improved over previous generations. So the next time that the monk gets redacted, just using the monk as an example, because it shows you this kind of arc of development of these chat books, um, this is, uh, there, there are basically two books here, Father Innocent, and the other one is Almagro and Claude, The Monastic Murder, which both of, both of them were published by Tegg and Castleman, and they're from 1801 and 1803. Um, and in both of these cases, what's happened is that the author who wrote this chat book, rather than simply pulling lines and pulling pieces out of the original, took the story into themselves, changed the names, and retold it in their own way. And they also divided up. So certain parts of the story are in Father Innocent. Certain parts of the story are in Almagro and Claude. Um, so it's kind of cool because the writers of these chat books did change the way that they read. And they targeted them better for the chat book reading audience. Um, there is a little creative enterprise in the way that they're written. Um, no direct plagiarism. Just some subtle changes in the characterization and the way that the stories flow timing-wise. So here's an example for you. Um, Matthew, oops, sorry, there's a picture. That's Almagro and Claude. Very cool, kind of bleeding nun picture. She's featured in this particular um, chat book. You can also see at the bottom here just how much we're talking about distribution. These things were so commonplace and just everywhere at this period of time. Okay. All right, so side by side comparison. This is the characterization of the bleeding nun when you first meet her, like before she's the bleeding nun. She's Beatrice de las Cisternas, right, originally. Um, on the left, we have Matthew Lewis's original. I have even taken some of this out because Mr. Lewis, bless him, spent more than 145 words describing the nun before she even does anything in her book, just her introduction, right? That's what I covered here. Uh, meanwhile, the person who redacted this or kind of rewrote this for Almagro and Claude accomplished the introduction of this character in 52 words. And when you're thinking about how these chapbooks work, I want you to notice the difference, not just in length, but also in the quality or character of this person between these two versions. So on the left, Beatrice took the veil at an early age, not by her own choice, but at the express command of her parents. 
She was then too young to regret the pleasures of, of which her profession deprived her, but no sooner did her warm and voluptuous character begin to be developed than she abandoned herself freely to the impulse of her passions and seized the first opportunity to procure their gratification. She lived at his castle several months as his avowed concubine. All Bavaria was scandalized by her imprudent and abandoned conduct. Ooh. Her feasts vied in luxury with Cleopatra's, and Lindenberg became the theater of the most unbridled debauchery. Not satisfied with displaying the incontinence of a prostitute, she professed herself an atheist. She took every opportunity to scoff at her monastic vows and loaded with ridicule the most sacred ceremonies of religion. So this, I, I cut out some more stuff at the beginning about how her impulsiveness was horrible. All right, and then here's the chapbook version. She took the veil at an early age, but when her ungovernable passions began to expand, she contrived to elope from the convent and fled to Germany with the Baron. Here she lived several months as his avowed concubine, professed herself an atheist, and disgusted the whole country by her grossness. So certainly the scene has been shortened for practical reasons, of course, but the effect of reading these two scenes uh, when you hear this, you could definitely see a rhetorical shift, I think. Um, the sexual content is less explicit. Uh, the nature of the grossness is left to your imagination. So you decide how foul she is. <laughs> um, her wealth and her debauchery have been played down. Like she is no longer being compared to Cleopatra, right? Um, all Bavaria is no longer thinking she's a scandal um, so much. Just they're generally disgusted by her. <laughs> so I think that what happens here, and in a lot of these chat books that come after this, is that the person who's writing these abridgments does this professionally, and they know their audience. They're working to please a publisher who needs a cheap publication, so it needs to be short. They also want to protect the reputation of the shop, so they need to make sure that it's not too scandalous, because they're probably also producing other more morally decent things, right? And then also, there's a need to meet the needs of this audience, right? Um, I had someone in my talk earlier point out that the reading level here is much lower for Almagro and Claude. You could approach this as a younger reader or a less experienced reader and be able to understand it better because the sentences are shorter. Um, it's a lower lexile if you want to talk in teacher talk, right? Um, so the, the abridgment basically does provide a different reading experience from Matthew Lewis's original novel. Also, the tempo is faster, the action is quicker, there are waves of sensationalism that just butt right up against each other. There's hardly a gap. These are very breathless, quick reads. Um, but despite this elevated kind of pace, um, the tone of the chat books is less florid. Um, so it's not just they cut the story down for smaller publication, but they also they made it easier to read and also a little more, um, what's a good way to put this? A little less poetic, more prosaic a little more storyteller-like. Um, okay. I also just, real quick, I, I think what Diane Longhovler always said about this is she thought that these original, like the monk, was pretty anti-Catholic. And even here on this page, you can see there's less anti-Catholicism on the right. Like there's maybe a little less ideological content makes it through the redaction. Okay. So then... This is the next one, <laughs> and you can see at this point we've gotten to a larger illustration that folds out. This is not a great scan, I apologize, this wasn't one of mine that I took. This one you're paying a full shilling for, so it's a little more expensive. Um, but here you get Sarah Schedule Wilkinson, who puts her own name on this tale. Um, and she is a professional chapbooker who's really uh, very famous at the time. She had published novels, too. If you're interested in Sarah Wilkinson, um, Franz has an entire chapter in his monograph about her, I believe. Um, he specializes in studying Sarah Wilkinson. Um, but famously, she could make a living as a writer. Uh, it's hard to be a woman of a certain class and try to make a living with your pen. So she would make chapbooks while she was teaching school and while she was being a governess and all these other types of things. Um, this just goes kind of to highlight the presence of women all throughout this field. Um, the Gothic chapbooks, illustrators, uh, people working in the publishing shops, there were female publishers who owned the publishing shops. There were women all over this profession, including the authors and illustrators and so on. Um, 
So it's, it's an interesting time actually to pay attention to because it's uh, multi-generational shops that are family enterprises and include children and women and all this kind of thing. Um, but what I was gonna point out about this is that um, Sarah Wilkinson makes this story her own in a way that um, is actually quite beautiful writing. Um, and if you wanna try to look at one of these retellings as you know, perhaps approaching something literary, I would suggest looking at Sarah Wilkinson to see what she does with it. Um, I think Almagro and Claude and Father Innocent are pretty good too. Um, I just think she's a level above whoever the author was of those. So this is 1820. So now we're towards the kind of peak of the period where this is the newer way of doing things. You get this large illustration. I wish I hadn't accidentally cut off well, anyway, it's a nice detailed caption that really retells the scene, gives the page number. So that's very cool, very interactive with the text. Um, and here you can also kind of assume, I'm guessing, because this one costs a shilling and not six pence, that this might have actually been like a nice enough purchase to make a gift or to maybe want to keep or, you know, have worth investing in, I guess I should say. It's a chapbook worth investing in for somebody who is really into these and who might want to keep it. Um, so really what this chapbook does, I think, is demonstrate the arc that we're moving toward um, when you could get 60 pages of very clear, fresh storytelling with color illustrations. This is probably colored by a grown-up. Most of it's inside the lines. Oh, oh man, maybe not the yellow. The yellow might have been done by a child. Um, it's really hard to say. It's just painted on color illustration. All right, this is kind of um, getting even farther towards the peak of this. So now we have a version in this later chapbook. Raymond and Agnes's story is still being told. This is Dean and Monday. And now we have moved to a series of four illustrations on the frontispiece. So this folds out. Um, it's like tri-folded. So it folds out three times and you get quite a large uh, page with almost, it looks like cartoon cells, right? It's really interesting how they're telling the story through the illustrations. Each one has a very, very short little caption and the page number is there. I'm just not sure if you can see it on your screen because it's very tiny, but they're still acting as a guide to the book, which is very cool. Um, and I should say too, that it's very likely that there were other chapbook adaptations of the monk that I don't know about. Um, obviously, <laughs> there are more chapbooks than we'll ever know because people threw them away. They didn't keep them. Um, and that there are authors other than um, Wilkinson whose names are on these publications. So Isaac Crookenden wrote them, Lucy Watkins wrote them, Mary Gogo Lewis, Louisa Teresa Bellenden Kerr. All of these are real people that we can prove wrote Gothic chapbooks. So eventually we're going to get down to being able to identify more and more of these authors. I just need some more time with that R software and my computer needs a better hard drive uh, processor, I mean. Okay. <clears throat> we do know though that it's hard to make a living in chapbooks for the writers. Um, this is because it's before the period of copyright. Once you've sold one of these stories, you're never going to get another penny from it. There are no residuals you know, there's nothing that you get for the next run of the book. Um, so what you got to write it is just what you got to write it. Um, so people like Sarah Wilkinson and Mary Gogo Lewis and all these writers that I just mentioned, we have evidence of them writing to the liter Literary Fund Society asking for financial support because it was very difficult for the writers to make a living here. All right. So I want to also say that the majority of these chapbooks that I've showed you, if you want to see them, you need to go to the New York Public Library, the Sadler Black Collection in the University of Virginia, the Newberry in Chicago, and the British Library in London. Um, they have quite a good collection of these as well, although a lot of them are bound. Um, and you can see all these elaborate illustrations firsthand. But now I'm going to try to show you as best I can over the internet what some of these more advanced illustrations look like. First of all, here's a close up of Agnes with her baby. And I just thought this might be good for you to see in terms of uh, how much detail is in the color, or, sorry, in the etching of this. So the person who's scratched all these thousands of little tiny lines on this copper plate, this is a process that takes hours and hours with a ruler very carefully um, making these gradations and so on um, into this copper plate 
to make the shadows and to make the outlines and all of that kind of stuff. Um, then the colorist here probably only took a, a short time to do this. If you think about, if you sat down and did a paint by number, it would take about that much time, just kind of filling in a few of the spots with some color, um, just with a paintbrush and some paint. All right, this is the loves and adventures of St. Gerard, the Valiant Knight. So this is poor Emma. And you can see Emma here. She is not so much an enchanted person is that she has been trapped in an enchanted tomb where she can't escape. Um, Sir Gerard has just rescued her in this scene and you can see that the tomb he's pulling her out of, that doesn't look like any fun at all. Um, this is kind of emblematic of many of these Gothic chapbook illustrations. They are often quasi pornographic images of men dragging women places. Um, so that's a little harsh, um, but the reality is she's happy to not be in her tomb, I guess. Um, and the various states of undress are also pretty common from this kind of creating the sensation as it also existed in the writing. Generally, the tone of these does match what's in the text. So if it's a quasi pornographic text, so is the illustration usually. Okay, so here we have the vampire or the bride of the isles. This is based on an opera, and I still can't remember the name of the person who wrote this opera. Mm, might be Planche. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's just an opera. Um, this is one of the earliest vampires in a chat book, a vampire in popular fiction, honestly. Um, and this is a really cool one, in my opinion, because if you've studied the Gothic at all, you'd know, like Anne Radcliffe, her entire thing where the supernatural is always explained, right? Well, in this case, in the illustration to this piece, you have somebody holding up a sheet on which is being projected this image of the vampire and Lord Ruthven. So the spirit is not actually in the room with this poor alarmed Lady Margaret, right? It's all supernatural explained. But boy, is it right on the nose when you put it in the illustration like that. I think that's kind of funny, actually, <laughs> that they did that. Um, but it also is really cool because it demonstrates the connection too between the early Gothic chapbook and the theater. So the theater really very much driving what kinds of material people are asking for from these printing shops or what the printers feel like making, obviously, because they're part of pop popular culture too. All right, then speaking of vampires, that opens another can of worms. I'm hoping you'll help me with any of you who want to do this. This is the Black Vampire which a lot of people are, have been writing about and studying, but they've been calling it a novella. I'm telling you, it's a chat book, um, but chat books that are printed in the United States are really rare. I don't know if Americans didn't keep them or if because we, are, we were such a eclectic bunch of weirdos during this period of time, maybe some of us burned them, who knows? Um, nonetheless, we don't have extant copies of American printed chat books very much. There are only a few. And I'd be very curious if anyone can know or find out what happened to them all, or did we just not print them here in the United States? I really don't know. I can't find good evidence for anything. Also, the black vampire here does not have an illustration. It just has this little ornate ragstock cover and that's it. So I'm very curious to know, was it just not prudish enough like did they not print an illustration because the new yorkers would have been sensationalized too much and heaven forbid or was this just trying to have it be taken more seriously because for example my little my little byron book with the gia hour this one doesn't have an illustration either and it's because it's trying to be literary right it's this is byron god forbid it should be illustrated Right. So maybe that's the case with the black vampire. I really don't know. But if anyone wants to do this research, it is out there begging to be done. Try to figure out what happened with this. Um, also, cool thing about the black vampire is it's unique. Um, it's not plagiarized from anything else. It's really complicated. It's got deep intertextuality with many other texts. Um, not obviously it's responding to Polidori and his the vampire but it also is boy does it talk about every other thing that's ever been written practically and um it also refers to current events it refers to specific people in new york society that's lambasting them um and somehow simultaneously it is racist and abolitionist it uplifts enslaved people and then kills them in the end it's this whole mess so it's a great 
story to try to study and figure out, please do. Um, I haven't had a chance to work on it yet, so I hope you will. I just got a chance to see it in person. This is a new copy acquired, um, or just acquired by the University of Virginia. It's in their special collections, you can go see. All right, so this one, this is Corville Castle, or the illegitimate son. Um, this one, another quasi-pornographic uh, sort of frontispiece, Julia seized by the two men who threw a cloth over her eyes and in that manner hurried her along. Um, they don't look like they're hurrying her to me. They look pretty mean, um, <laughs> like they're carrying her off. Um, but I just wanted to show you this one for the detail. Look at all the stippling that makes the sky in the background. There's the little tiny points being poked into the um, engraving plate. Um, you have water back here with mountains. It's a really detailed and lush. And then her appearance, the way that her dress flows, the kind of texture of this, there's real artistry involved in creating this illustration, which does refer to one of the scenes in the book and kind of illustrates the way she's being hauled from land onto sea. Um, so that's pretty interesting unto itself. All right, this is the Duchess of Sea, which is probably the most famous of the Gothic chapbooks because so many copies of it are extant today. Um, I think that might have been because it was printed in such large quantities at first. It was very popular when it was first printed. This is an 1803 edition, once again with the kind of quasi-pornographic man dragging a woman off. And she seems to be putting up a bit of a scrap this time, so that's nice that she's resisting. Um, so the reason I wanted to show you this particular specimen is that I want you to know what these look like when they've been bound by the consumer. So the person who owned this originally took this and seven other Gothic chapbooks to some bindery, uh, I think in London, my guess is in London, um, and had it bound in calfskin. And they trimmed all of the chapbooks in a big stack with a guillotine to be all matching on the edges. But when you look at them, you can kind of tell that's happened because all of their margins are a little artificially narrow because they've been lined up and sliced a little bit close to the text block. That's the same reason that when you look at the gutter here, so in between where the binding is pulling the pages together, you can see that the um, inside edge of the illustration gets pulled into the binding a little bit. It was never intended to be bound so tightly. It's a little bit too tight in the middle of this book. Um, so you can tell there that that's an aftermarket binding. Doesn't quite fit. Okay. Um, also, you can see when you look at this too, when you like flip through, sometimes they will have not taken the wrapper off. So there's a stripe right here. I don't know if you can even see it. There are a couple of stripes when you look at the pages as they're laying here that have color in them. And that's because they've left the wrapper on when they did the publication, when they made the binding. So that's interesting for you to see. Um, if you're at a library and you just want to check to see if they have any Gothic stories, books, or Gothic tales, sometimes they're just called pamphlets or tracts. It'll just be a book called tracts. Um, and you can look in there and see if you can find any Gothic chat books. There are just lots of them that have been hidden like this over the course of time. All right, so this one is kind of presenting for you the apex of what this um, technology turned out to be. Um, this is Theodore and Clementina. This is a specimen from, I think, 1825, yep, 1825. And what they've got here is introducing the main characters in the center. Um, so you get to see their faces first. And you know which one is which before you even start looking at the illustrations. And then, the four um, panels here with detailed um, descriptions, and they did have page numbers. You just can't really see them the way I've got this laid out, sorry. Um, so kind of retelling the story through images. Um, this really, this five piece, this five pane frontispiece becomes the standard toward the end. And people like Hodgson and company would run entire series of chat books that all had the same type of frontispiece. So you could get a set together for yourself and they would all match and look the same. So it's kind of cool like that. A little collectible, even though they were only six pence. All right, this is the fiery castle, which I wanted to show you because it's a nice contrast against all these ravishment scenes that I was showing you before. 
Um, I want you to know that partly perhaps because so many women were in this field, there are some Gothic chapbooks that do play with gender. In this case, we have a female knight who is the daughter of a sorcerer and a fairy. Um, it's this whole thing. Um, and she does go and invade this fiery castle along with this gentleman. Um, but the castle is a, uh, it's not just on fire, on fire. It's metaphorically on fire because it's a temple of love and there's like a big orgy in there. And she's able to resist the seducing beasts, but he's not. So it is she in the end who kind of rescues everybody from this uh, temple of love and illusion. So it's interesting because it's a female heroine who rescues another damsel. Very cool. Okay. Um, just in conclusion, I, I'm going to leave a slide up while I tell you my conclusion. Um, so I think that by transmitting the Gothic to so many people, the working class and the middle class, what the chapbooks did was make this readership hungry for more print material that's accompanied by illustration. Um, I do think that although this illustrated chapbook didn't survive the transition to the machine produced or mass produced piece, the idea of the illustration um, does catch on. And when you look at things like Penny Dreadfuls and books in parts, they are so very often in the 1830s and going forward illustrated either on every chapter or at least every um, series that gets sent out and the serial fiction. Um, so for this reason, I really think we should view these chapbooks as distinct from their 18th century counterparts or forebears and consider them to be kind of the leading edge of 19th century popular fiction. All right, thank you so much. Does, do I have questions?